and a warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. Tonight on the show, I thought of talking about the current political setup with the UNP's Ranil Vikrama Singh um, taking oath as Prime Minister. We see a new economic program being presented and talks of a national government. But at the same time, is this a certain uh, setup that will work for the Sri Lanka Parliament and the Sri Lankan economy? To discuss this, I've invited to our studios um, someone who is uh, very synonymous with decisions taken in the UNP in the past, a former Deputy Minister um, and a former parliamentarian from the United National Party, Navin Desanayaka. I born and a very warm welcome. Thank you for having me, Indivari. How how have you been since uh, your uh, period of not being yeah. represented in Parliament? Well, I'm uh, looking back at my career mm -hmm. and uh, very happy that uh, I was able to rise up in the ranks of the party and also as a parliamentarian for 20 years and um, finally uh, culminating in my position as the Minister of Plantation Industries. Mm -hmm and also um, having the ministries of tourism and sports mm -hmm. before that. So um, in a way with what's happening now in Diwari, uh, maybe uh, I've been fortuitous that I'm not in parliament, you know, because <laughs> it seems like um, uh, to be in parliament and to be amongst the 225 is a very unlucky thing these days. So, uh, looking back, I think, uh, you know, may maybe it was I was lucky not to get in. But uh, having said that, uh, per the constitution of our country, uh, the legislative power is with parliament. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, all major legislative enactments, the constitution, um, uh, major administrative decisions are done through parliament. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have this uh, system where uh, for the past uh, 70 odd years we've been having a parliamentary democracy mm -hmm. and people elect their leaders people elect their national rep uh, parliamentarians and the leadership is cu culminating from the parliament mm. so there is a system in place whether the system works or not is left to be seen a uh, vast majority of Sri Lankans today mm -hmm. as I speak to you now will say that the system has failed mm. um, but of course uh, you have to take the good and the bad a uh, lot of good things have been done in this country by various governments mm -hmm. but when people are emotional and people are hungry and uh, they're waiting in queues for seven eight hours to get some basic diesel and petrol mm -hmm. when you have power cuts for three and a half hours every day and uh, maybe even more in the future people are very emotional mm -hmm. and uh, I think in that context um, we as Sri Lankans will have to make some hard decisions um, uh, intellectually and also emotionally mm. of where we are going to head as a nation. Um, what is your role currently with the UNP at the party? Yeah. I am a working committee member mm -hmm. and I'm a district leader of Norelia. Uh, <coughs> of course I was the national organizer uh, till about five months ago but uh, given some certain... Um, uh, but why did you refuse? No, it was, it was, I felt that uh, at that particular moment of time mm -hmm. when uh, so-called slots were filled, mm -hmm. I should have been given a, a more senior position uh, than the national organisership which I was uh, entertaining at that time. So that is a view that I uh, expose within the party mm -hmm. because I'm very careful with um, f carrying on a fight within the party. I, I think in a democratic party, we should all have that right to express ourselves within the party. <coughs> if your views are not heard, you can then go outside the party and then, you know, it's, it's a different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. But since we lost, since the UMP was wiped out in the last general election, uh, I did not want to uh, move my political allegiances because essentially I believe in a kind of intellectual approach to politics. And uh, I have always been a, a right of center thinker, whether it's economically, uh, politically, my thinking has been right of center, not right of uh, left. So I think UNP captures that thinking. And, and even uh, when Mr. Vikrama Singh, the Prime Minister, made that speech, he mentioned Air Lanka, how Air Lanka has to be privatized. Mm. <coughs> I, I'm not saying that, now some people will get very upset with that, mm. especially the so-called 
left thinkers. But, but I feel that uh, loss-making entities like Air Lanka uh, will have to go into public-private partnerships. Mm. And that's the UNP thinking. Right. So, so whether you look at it in a positive or negative way, uh, is left to be seen from your own uh, political angles. Right. But <coughs> essentially, the UNP is a market-driven, uh, market-centered political party. And, and I believe so your thinking lies with the party policy. Yes, present. yes, because UNP, when it uh, when it was formed in 1947, it was ingrained with a certain amount of values, and, and I would say the first value is uh, conservatism, economic conservatism, and uh, <coughs> that also entails uh, right of centre thinking. So the centre is where the socialist angle comes in, mm -hmm. where you. Uh, where the government or the state provides for the less privileged. Mm. But you must have a market economy. Mm. So, so when, when you had uh, in the 60s and the 70s all this nationalism and all that, that's what dragged the economy back. Mm -hmm. I would say it actually stifled the economy. Yeah. So and after I after 77, mm -hmm. then with uh, Mr. Jaja Vadana coming back, mm. you had a huge economic res resurgence after that. And we were able to, <coughs> in a decade's time, we had a very strong uh, market-driven economy. So that is what is there today as well. So you must not interfere too much in the market economy. Mm. That is my basic philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, with the current setup, we see Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, uh, a single national uh, seat mm. uh, that was uh, uh, that the U UNP was able to secure after mm. the party's defeat mm. in the general elections, mm. was able to uh, come forward to accept premiership mm. uh, during this crisis. Mm. But do you think the United National Party policies, the economic policies especially, mm. Mm. are reflected in the, the first few days of uh, mm. him being appointed Prime Minister? And do you think UNP policies will actually be the solution? Well, I Actually, when this appointment was made, mm. uh, I made a Twitter comment and I said I am apprehensive and concerned about RW UNP being appointed as PM. Mm. But in similar way, and I said I hope for the sake of the country and our party uh, that the new PM will succeed. Mm. So, when why, you, when, wh when you, wh why the apprehension? Apprehension is because you know, I mean, um, uh, he is a single MP, mm. and uh, he is going into, I would not say. Uh, uh, a den of lions, but a den of wolves. Mm. I would say that. So he's, you know, he's fighting on on his own. Mm. We are not there in parliament to back him. Mm. Uh, number one. Mm. Uh, number two is, if he succeeds, all the best, all the better for the country also. Uh, but by chance, if they don't allow him to work, then that's another issue. Mm. But I think essentially, if you are a leader, you have to stand up. Right, and uh, my father had gone through this. Uh, Atulat Mudali Lalit had gone through this. If you want to be a leader, you must. When the challenge is there, you have to get up. And I think that's what he did. And he is a person who has gone through many challenges. Uh, you can look at it from a political uh, lenses. So uh, some people who are uh, pro UNP, SJB, Sajabha, they might not like this decision. Mm. People who are uh, maybe who are pro uh, Pohutu might like it because it kind of salvages them. Mm. Then uh, JEP definitely doesn't like it. Mm. So, but right now I think we have to think as Sri Lankans. And and if if this if you compare Sri Lanka to a sinking ship, we are all almost sunk. We are almost finished. Mm. So whatever that is left, somebody has to step up and salvage it. Mm. So, so I think for us, it's a salvaging operation. Are we seeing UNP, uh, the policy direction or uh, certain policies that the, the economic thinking that we yeah, see within yeah, the party being implemented yeah. now? So I think, uh, I think in that conversation that uh, the Prime Minister had with the uh, President, mm -hmm. uh, that, that would have definitely been there. Mm -hmm. uh, he would have definitely told, I want a free hand to implement my policies. Mm. Uh, and they definitely in the first speech itself, that thinking was evident. Mm. He, uh, he uh, underlined the core issues mm. that are uh, stifling our country and has brought into bankruptcy. And he very clearly mentioned Air Lanka. And he said that uh, we need private-public partnerships and privatization. And that is the UMP thinking, like I outlined to you. And he was very frank in his uh, speech. He, he mentioned about the CEB, the cost of power, and how it's subsidized. 
he mentioned about uh, Ceylon Petroleum Corporation and how, how, how that is subsidized and how the people are losing out and how the country is losing out. So, so that is what I'm saying right at the start when I started this. Mm -hmm. There has to be market-driven supply and demand economics in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly, between you and me, if we had, for example, three or four players in the petroleum market, if the CPC can't deliver petroleum, then maybe there was, there was some foreign player, maybe a Japanese company or an Indian company who had dollars mm -hmm. who can bring the petroleum down and give it to our people. So right now, because it's a monopoly, and because electricity is a monopoly, mm. and because so many other things in this country are monopolies, uh, you know, people have not, people are not given the the choice that other countries, other consumers in other countries have. Mm. So that's why I'm saying, um, for from 1994, ever since the UMP lost uh, uh, the presidency, we have not had a major economic reform in this country. So, uh, yes. so right now, we we have to while we stop the bleeding. The Prime Minister has to stop the bleeding, that's why he's there. Mm. Right? The patient is dying, mm. almost dead, mm. right? but still there's some breath left in it, in the body. So the Prime Minister's job is a short term to revive the patient, to get some oxygen into the system. Then me medium term, right? He has within one year he has to get the balances right, he has to get some funds flowing in. And then of course long term, if the UMP is fortunate enough to come back, mm then to revive the economy again and, and get these reforms going. Without reforms, you can't move forward. Uh, you spoke about uh, you know uh, outside investments coming in, whether mm. it's a monopoly or not. Mm. Uh, over the years, we've seen bottlenecks, mm. investment uh, mm. uh, bureaucracy, mm. and uh, we don't see a sufficient ease of doing business and, mm. and an environment for investments to come in, mm. which is a major reason why we are in this crisis mm. today. Mm. The UNP2 in 2015, being a major party to the government of good governance, don't you think failed to uh, set up that, that environment yeah. for investments to move into the country? Very good question. I'm uh, fortunate to, in my career, I was in the Board of Investment, mm -hmm. State Minister mm -hmm. of uh, Investments, uh, and uh, from 2007 to 2010. So I had a very uh, vast experience in FDI. And uh, Dhammika Pereira and myself, uh, and with a uh, few ministers that we had, like Andre Appa, he was there, Dr. Amnogama. Uh, during that crucial time during the war, mm -hmm. we were able to get about $800 million per year. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was good. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of work, and the, I must say, Dhammika also, he drove the BOI. Mm -hmm. We had some good officials as well. So essentially, from 1979, uh, Jaya Jayawadana brought in the Greater Colombo Economic Commission. And from that, we had the BOI zones coming in. The UNP is the bedrock of economic zones in this country. We have about 10 or 12 zones. Ranil Vikramasinghe started the Kokkala Free Trade Zone, mm. 1993 or 1994. So from then onwards, from 1994, we haven't had a single zone coming up, like apart from the Hambantota zone now, that is now coming up. We haven't had uh, economic zones being, uh, being built up in this country. So I would say that from 1994, again, backward thinking uh, about economic zones, about investments coming into Sri Lanka. We need FDI, foreign direct investment. If we had FDIs coming in, this dollar crisis would not have come in like this. Mm. We need at least about five to seven billion dollars coming in through FDI. If we had that, our, our economic reserves would have been much more greater. But we have driven away many investors, uh, also prospective yes. investors, because of this, uh, the yes. environment and uh, the negativity in the system. Yes, so when you have, uh, when you investors now, today, have uh, so many options, they can go to Vietnam, as you know, Bangladesh is doing extremely well. We can't, we can't just say we are the only person uh, in the beach anymore, mm. right? So we, when we ask commissions, when people ask commissions of 10, 20, sometimes 30 percent from projects, nobody is going to come here. So you need a very transparent, very fluid. Mm. Uh, BOI was meant as a one-stop shop, but it's no longer. You have to go to Environment Ministry, you have to go to the Water Ministry, you have to go to the Power Ministry to get permissions. So nobody is going to do that. You need a one-stop shop. You need efficiency. You need uh, incorruptible people in those places. Uh, and that's the way to go. And, and, and Sri Lanka needs political stability. So without that, uh, investments are not going to come in. But I can tell you very frankly that uh, during the 2015-2019 period, uh, we had some major investments coming in. One is that uh, recently opened a tire factory 
that uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa went and opened. We, we, I myself went and uh, went for that uh, opening ceremony, went for the starting ceremony, the, the foundation laying ceremony. And we were getting our investments in, in order. We had 2019 when we gave the government back, we had 7.5 billion in reserves, in, in dollar reserves. So what, where did all that money go? So in your view, what happened to the Sri Lankan economy? Uh, I'd like to take a politician's perspective here mm. because we've sp spoken to a lot of academics mm. um, as well as intellectuals. Mm. But uh, what do you think happened? You've been, uh, you mentioned the 2017 uh, 17 period when you mm. crossed over mm. to the Rajapaksa government mm. and you've been with the good governance mm. uh, government as well mm. as a member of the United National Party. So in 2007, not 2017, 2007, uh, 17 of us from the UNP. UNP had agreement with, uh, uh, at that time it was uh, SL, the Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna, uh, with Mahindra Rajapaksa, our chairman at that time, Rukman Senanayaka. He went and signed an agreement with, uh, with Mahindra Rajapaksa to help uh, Mahindra in the war. Mm. So then when we wanted uh, actual help, uh, we couldn't do that. So then, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this in context because I've also been in that position and, and we decided to help Mahindra Rajapaksa to end the war. Mm. So 17 of us went over and then we helped him. Mm. And, but unfortunately, uh, in terms of the country, the war was finished, but then the Rajapaksas took the entire credit for it. That's a different issue. So when you're a leader and when you, when you, when you feel that you know, you have to change things. Uh, you, you have to bite the bullet and make that decision. We were criticized a lot. Mm. Um, and but we do you still stand by that decision? I do. Think, uh, I, I, I do. I do. Because you've been a critic of uh, Ranil Wickremesinghe as your party leader too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you criticize the Rajapaksas as well. Um, you wor worked with the Rajapaksas mm. and then you criticized mm. Ranil Wickremesinghe. Mm. But you're here now talking and backing UNP policies. Yes. But do you stand by that decision? And what is the stance? Yeah. So, so I, I believe the war had to be ended. Mm. And uh, because of our stance, we were able to finish the war. Otherwise, the, the government would have collapsed in 2007 mm. in the budget. Uh, so our, our, we showed up the government, and the wars, war was able to be finished in 2009. Then I realized where the country was going. Basically, the Rajapaksas were being very corrupt, and uh, they were taking the country for a ride. So then I uh, joined the Maitri Palasiri Sena. Uh, presidency that campaign and I joined the UNP and I'm still in the UNP. Mm. I don't... Uh, so you never wanted to break away and um, go ahead with Sajid Premadasa no, and no, Sajid No, no, no. I, th I thought that was a mistake. By I, th I thought I thought Sajid made a mistake and I also thought that Rani Lawson could have been a bit more accommodating uh, to keep Sajid in. But uh, Sajid won um, yes, uh, yes, major yes. opposition. Of course, uh, of share course, of course, parliament. of course. We didn't read. I didn't. I personally didn't read the the the, the public, the UMP's uh, thinking. I mean, the heart core heart of the UMP was with Sajid. Mm. So I didn't read that at that time. I felt I had gone. I had left the UMP. I didn't want to leave the UMP again. I still am. I am still strong believer in the party. And uh, I, I believe that all forces have to unite to defeat the Rajapaksas. Saying that, I believe at this point, particular moment of time, because we are basically uh, in a survival mode now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the next two, three months will we'll define whether we as a country will survive or not. So we have to breathe first mm -hmm. to survive, and then you can do your politics. Uh, when you say all forces should unite to beat the Rajapaksas now, mm. there is a massive protest and agitation against mm. the mm. Rajapaksas mm. and their government. Mm. At the same time, uh, politically, mm. uh, the United National Party is in a unique position mm. with um, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe, with just one seat, as mm. we said, mm. uh, is heading the government. Mm. Uh, will will uh, the United National Party used this as an opportunity to, uh, to uh, as a springboard for mm. a revival and to come back into national politics in a major way, rather mm. than solving this national crisis. So, so basically, if you do the numbers, mm. um, we've had roughly two million UNPers mm. staying at home and not voting for either the UNP or the SJB. Mm. SJB only had 2.7 million votes coming into the SJB. UNP had 256,000. So in that context, um, a vast majority of UMP has boycotted the last general election. So this is what I keep asking all the time. What, what are UMP wanting right now? 
So I would say that the dis decision by uh, Mr. Vikram Singh huh, is, is really to salvage the economy of this country. Mm. I, like I mentioned, I have my apprehensions about it, but as a leader, you have to you have to stand up. You have to you have to deliver. Otherwise, you're, you're shirking in your responsibilities. Now, this decision, there were three or four names that were mentioned uh, before Ranil Vikramasinghe's name came into it. Mm. One was uh, the one was Mr. Vikramasinghe, other was Sajit, other was uh, uh, Dallas Alha Peruma, and uh, other was Mr. Karuja Suri, my father-in-law, who uh, the civil society and uh, there was a voice saying a non-politician should be the prime minister to unite all the forces. Unfortunately, he was not in Parliament. Mm. Sajid, for various reasons, uh, did not want to take it up. He put some conditions that were not acceptable to President Rajapaksa. I don't think Dallas al was ever a starter. And uh, then it uh, came to Mr. Vikramasinghe. Mm. So, so I think given the history of the UNP, given the history of challenges the UNP has faced, given the leadership leaders that UNP has thrown up, who has stood up and put their hands up when there's a crisis, I think there's a very strong tradition that uh, that is in the UMP. Mm -hmm. So that, that is why I think Mr. Vikram Singh took this challenge. Mm -hmm. so, so I think in, in, the, in that context, we as Sri Lankans, I'm not saying we as UNPers or we as Pudujana Peramuna supporters or we as JVPers, we should look at this as Sri Lankans and, and, and give him a chance at least, maybe three, four, five or six months to, to revive this and get us going again. Because since he has taken this challenge, instead of being kuhaka and, and trying to undermine him, right? let us get together and, and revive the economy that, that will surely salvage our, our own people. I mean, when you see people in queues today, right? when you see the power cuts, when you see the unproductive nature of our country now, um, you, know, you wonder where the country is going. So I, I, I feel in that context, in the contextual nature of the Sri Lankan economy, in the contextual nature of the Sri Lankan political entities now, you have to get together to revive this nation. You said you do not regret your decision in 2017 to cross over. And 2007. Seven, yeah, uh, yeah, seven yeah, rather, yeah. I beg your pardon. Yeah. 2007 to uh, cross over and uh, support the Rajapaksa regime um, to, to uh, support Sri Lanka's war against terrorism. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you returned to the UNP. And now we are at a similar crisis, yeah. a bigger crisis, a crisis that Sri Lanka has not seen before. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think uh, that the Sri Lankan parliament has that political maturity and the will to work together. Um, yes, there's Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe at the head of the government, but we also see uh, other parties expressing their willingness to support mm, yes. any good decisions yes. taken yes. by uh, the yes. government. But yes. do you think they, this, this parliament will be able to work with, with that national agenda yes. Yes. as a priority? Yes. Well, I think, I think, I think we should not be negative on this. I think we should be positive. I, I think the SJB's current statement of helping the Prime Minister without undermining him yeah. is a very positive development. Um, that group of 40 independent MPs led by Maitri Palasir Sena have also said that, that they won't undermine the, yeah. the efforts of the Prime Minister. Uh, so those are very positive developments because I think the, the parliamentarians also know that history will judge them yeah. and uh, history will castigate them. If, uh, if they do not have a national interest at heart at this moment, mm. and if they are going to uh, uh, do petty politics at this crucial level, uh, this is like actually, you know, I would compare it to World War II when Hitler invaded uh, the United Kingdom and, uh, you know, they, the British people got together to defeat Hitler. So it's a, it's a moment of crisis for Sri Lankans. You know, people are starving, people have no food on their table, people have no fuel, people have no gas. So it's a, it's a moment of deep crisis, and, and out of this crisis, a new nation can emerge, or we can really sink as a nation. It's, it's the choices for the people, the choices for these petty politicians uh, to lay aside their arrogance and their selfishness and work towards a common cause. We'll take a short break on that note. We are in conversation with former parliamentarian of the United National Party, Navin Desanayaka. back. We are in conversation with the former State Minister of Investment Promotion, um, then Minister of Plantation Industries and uh, 
a former parliamentarian of the United National Party. Um, we've spoken about your uh, thinking in terms of where we went wrong, what happened to the UNP, and what should have been done. But let's look in a futuristic sense on the national economy. You have a master's, you read for a master's in finance and financial law from the University of law, uh, London. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, what do you think should be the next step? Of course, we see Prime Minister Ranil Vikrama Singh laying out his uh, uh, agenda and his uh, the process that he wants, the program he wants to take. But uh, we see queues, as you mm, said, outside. Mm, this mm. is a big problem. We mm. have to have a solution to, at least in the intermediate, mm. um, have solutions to mm. give our tokens or mm. something mm. to the general public. Mm. Um, and in terms of uh, the food mm. um, uh, availability mm. for the people, mm. medicine, mm. we know that UNP has appointed committees. Mm. Uh, those are not represented in parliament, but mm. they're looking into this. Mm. So, mm. so what's your take? So basically what you need is, uh, the problem is, I don't have to go into uh, these things because uh, people know these facts. Mm. The fact of the matter is that, you know, we have no dollars. Mm. I think we're down to our last one million dollars or something too. So that is not going to, that's nothing basically. Mm. Even 50 million dollars is nothing in terms of a country. So we've, we've defended the rupee. This is where we went wrong. We defended the rupee on the international markets. Out of the $7.5 billion we left, $4.5 billion was left, was used up to defend the rupee, all for, all for nothing, just down the drain. Then, uh, soon as the government came in, they reduced the taxes, that's the GST, uh, taxes by 15 to 8%, mm. and corporate taxes from 28 to 20%. Revenue loss of 600 billion rupees per year huge hole you can't feel you know you have to feel someone has to you have to feel that hole so i think immediately to buy the medicine to buy the fuel uh, you need roughly about 700 million dollars 500 million for fuel, for fuel and another 200 million not for essential items like medicine so 700 million per month hmm. which we don't have at the moment so you are looking at 3.5 billion to 4 billion dollars immediately hmm coming into government coffers. Now, who will give that? Who will give that? Uh, because there's nothing called a free lunch in the world. Uh, there are always conditionalities. India has been kind enough to extend this 2.5 and now 1 billion uh, in terms of fuel, fuel subsidy. And that has really helped us. We are running on that at the moment. So, but we need, we need this uh, 3.5 to 4 billion coming in. So that is where Mr. Vikram Singh has to work his magic. Mm. And uh, he's already opening doors. He's already meeting people. He's already talking to people. So let's, let's hope that uh, something can happen. Mm. And I think the country wants that from him. Mm. So, so we are also very hopeful. I mean, if at all anybody can do it, it's, it's an internationalist like him who can do it. Mm. I don't think, uh, I mean, with the greatest of respect to my friend, Dala Salah Peruma, uh, I don't think if he was the PM, he could, he could open those doors. Uh, so, so I, I, let's let's be positive about this. If we don't get it, we are not going to survive. Simple as that. And uh, whatever funds that come into the country, uh, country be it India or other uh, countries that support Sri Lanka, are we going to spend all that on fuel? Because there should be a, a different mm, program yeah, yeah, here yeah. where we uh, have our reserves also for yeah. essential, other yeah. essential purchases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what in your view should be prioritized here and what program do you prefer? So let's, let's, let's have a theoretical approach to this. Let's be also practical. Mm. If you can get one, 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 that is one billion, one B, one B, one B from China, India and Japan mm. and one B from the West, mm. that's four B. Uh, that's coming as a grant. Mm. And then you survive with that for the next seven, eight months. Mm. Then you have to go into serious uh, negotiations with the IMF, mm. and that will take six months. So then you're looking at the RFI, rapid fire instrument, mm. that will hopefully give about two to three billion, and also the rapid credit facility, also that the IMF has. And of course, the more, more painful stuff will have to come after two, three, within the two, three years. Mm. That's a structural adjustment program mm. that will entail raising of taxes, cutting of subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. That is a program, I'm sure as Harsha has mentioned and other economists have mentioned, that we write and give to the IMF. Mm. And then the IMF accepts it or not. So those are painful conversations with the IMF and the World Bank and other lending institutions. Mm. 
I am uh, confident that the bilateral donor countries like China, India and Japan, they will restructure our debt. Problem is going to be on the ISBNs, that's the international instruments that we have issued and raised debt. Mm. Those are going to be very, very difficult because I'm a lawyer, I already know that these, uh, some of these uh, uh, banks, private banks, institutional banks that have uh, guaranteed these ISBNs, they're already looking at legal action against us. Mm. So th that those are going to be very tough. So uh, I think we need a common approach to that and we have to bite the bullet and uh, talk to these people. Mm -hmm. And they also know that if Sri Lanka collapses in, in, in its entirety, they will never be paid a single dollar. So it's, up, so it's in their interest to keep us afloat. And then we, we, we manage to survive, we manage to breathe, and then we, we have to prosper. And, and then only can we uh, generate a cash flow um, that can uh, give the uh, give the ISBNs and make the repayments back. Mm -hmm. If we survive, I mean, if we if we crash, it's just a basic economics like any entity, private entity. If it crashes, all its debts are then not paid by anybody. For the last decade, we've been talking about how Sri Lanka has been getting closer to China mm. and uh, the need for a level playing field for mm. superpowers. And mm. then, under a UNP-led government, mm. how uh, China. China's interest or uh, China was neglected or the mm. investments brought in by China mm. were, were uh, unfortunately not um, taken mm. in, in positively by the mm. UNP-led government. Mm. Uh, what fears now for Sri Lanka, especially when we have to have the support of all these countries, mm. do you think there will be undue advantage to these countries as a result? In the very, I'm very close to the Chinese establishment. Mm. Chinese establishment and the Japanese establishment and the Indian establishment, their assistance to Sri Lanka is varied and different mm. based on their policies. Mm. Now, for example, the Chinese, they don't give money for uh, balance of payment support. Mm. They don't just, uh, you know, they specifically give money for projects. Mm. So it is the Sri Lankan government that writes the projects and tells them we want the, man we want the money for these projects. Mm. So we are the ones who said we want the Hambantota port and we are the ones who said we want the Hambantota international airport. It's our government that said that. So they, they uh, basically complied to our request. So when, when we write a report without a meaningful cash flow, without a meaningful feasibility, uh, it's our fault, it's not their fault. And then when the UNP came, we basically did a debt to equity swap with the China, with the China port in Hambantota. So we got, we did not have to pay that $800 million. <laughs> we, couldn't have pay, we couldn't have paid it then. Uh, that was a good decision that uh, Mr. Vikram Singh made. Because if we were stuck with that now, can we imagine paying that? No way. So we, we gave the equity to them, I think about 90% equity back. And now they are the owners of that port on a long-term 99-year lease. So those are good decisions that we made. The private sector, the engine of economic uh, activity, yeah. driving the economy even at this stage, yeah. there will be challenge. There are challenges as we speak, and there will be severe challenges if the economy continues as this. Yeah. Yeah. But in the public sector too, there are loss-making entities. Uh, you spoke of Sri Lankan Airlines, and you uh, mentioned the Prime Minister's initial statement about the need to privatize. Yeah. He mentioned yeah. uh, Sri Lankan Airlines, the national carrier. Yeah. Uh, while doing that, what other entities can we uh, utilize in such a way that it uh, spurs revenue within the country rather yes. than just looking at the foreign exchange of crisis course, only? Um, State-owned entities, yeah. uh, public sector, yeah. whether be it private public yeah. partnerships yeah. or investment. Yeah. What's your take here? So here, here we have uh, uh, one angle. One is that state. SOE, state uh, enterprises that are running at a huge loss. Mm. So there, there are certain models that you can adapt. One is uh, what I call the Margaret Thatcher model, mm -hmm. where she privatized uh, British Airways. Uh, and you do that in a very transparent way. You get a valuation done. And then through the valuation, you, uh, you invite expressions of interest. And then you shell the shares, either 48%, 49 or 50% mm. in the share market. Mm. That's one model. Um, and but you have to have a transparent process for that otherwise the state entities will be ripped off by uh, very greedy entities who just want to uh, make a profit out of our institution so you that that must be in place but the political will to do that has to be there mm -hmm. 
That's why I'm very happy that Mr. Vikram mentioned, uh, Mr. Vikram Singh mentioned about Sri Lankan Airlines, because frankly, as you know, uh, in Diwari, we, we've had uh, this process reversed in Sri Lankan Airlines. I saw a graph recently where Emirates was managing this, mm. uh, profits were slowly going up. And all of a sudden, because uh, the state head were not given some seats when he went, he, he came back 24 hours later, he took uh, Sri Lankan Airlines. Mm. And then from then onwards, 35 billion loss up to now per year. Mm. Cumulative loss about 200 billion. Mm. All, all people's money. Right? So how longer can you sustain these entities? Then, of course, I've been a member of the uh, Committee on uh, Power and Energy for about 10 years. We've had several discussions with uh, the Ceylon Electricity Board and uh, Ceylon Petroleum Corporation. For example, Ceylon, uh, CEB, Ceylon Electricity Board, we've told them to break it up into five units so that uh, there'll be a marketing unit, there'll be a purchasing unit, mm -hmm. there'll be a distribution unit, like that. So much of reforms could have been done, but they don't want to reform it. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are very happy with the status quo. Mm -hmm. And now it has been accumulating, the losses have been going up, no, no desire to make any profit, no desire to give anything back to the people. So, so these, are, these are very hard decisions that the Sri Lankan people will have to come to. I mean, we are, we are, we are very conversant with this, we can speak in English and tell this. But, but the hard message to the Sri Lankan people will have to be told to them that uh, these um, loss-making institutions can no longer be sustainable in a modern market-driven economy. I'm, I'm, I'm using the word market-driven again because it, it cannot be a state-driven uh, sector. It has to be a supply and demand-based, market-driven, uh, where care every, every rupee or dollar is accounted for and, and there, are, there are corporate heads making a profit for the institution. Should that be the stance of uh, any government that comes to power? Basic economics in the very, you have to do this, otherwise you can't take the country forward. And we are only, a, we are not a big nation, 21, 22 million people. I mean, why can't we understand the base, basics of economics? Because because from this has been going on from 1960s, can we believe it now? Mr. Vasudevan Anaykar, my father's good friend, up until three months ago, he was telling not to go to the IMF. Right, when we have gone to the IMF 14 times from 1965. So these are very basic things. I, I don't, in English there's a word called no-brainer. These are no-brainers. I mean, we don't have to discuss this for hours and hours. These are countries do this. Countries have to come to grips with the reality. Uh, you are <coughs> a minister of plantation industries. I'd like to talk a little about uh, the decision by the president for an organic push. Mm. Uh, currently we're talking about a potential food crisis mm. in mm. the country. Of course, the Prime Minister assured that mm. there won't be a hunger crisis in mm. Sri Lanka, but the reality is also that we do not have mm. sufficient food mm. or those who cannot afford don't have the necessary relief mm. provided. But when we were talking about a manufacturing economy today, there is a need to talk about reviving our agro-based yep. economy. Yep. So that organic push and what we've lost to what we should do now in order to uh, produce the food we need within mm. the country. Mm. Well, you know, uh, in the very, it's very sad. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in your station now, and I mentioned this to you before the, the interview happened. I, I said, you know, I saw that there are also backing this organic push. I mean, you can have your views on this. Um, I was one minister who was adamant because I did my research on it. I read, I read many articles on this. Uh, you can't be having uh, organic for commercial agriculture. You can't do that. It, it's, it's simply not going to go anywhere. You can do it for 50 acres, 50 hectares, small amounts of land. I mean, if you're an agri agriculturalist and a, an entrepreneur, you can do it on your land. But if you're having thousands of acres like the tea plantations, you need weedicide. So, so when Maitri Parasirisena bought this ban on weedicide, a particular uh, uh, grade called uh, glyphosate, I said no. I said the industry needs a weedicide and I stood my ground and finally after one year after the damage was done, he gave it back. A country like Japan, uh, I'm talking through the perspective of the tea industry, that, has, that places a very strong emphasis on consumer protection and consumer health. When I went as the Minister of Plantation Industries, they said, we want glyphosate. They said that. Hmm. The tea industry in Japan said, we want a weedicide. 
because we have done our research, it doesn't cause any harm to our consumers. I, be, I base my arguments on that, why, why we should not go for a total organic. And you can't do organic in 24-7. It, it has to be a very gradual process. So when the president uh, announced this, I was very surprised again. Uh, not only we decide, uh, fertilize as well. So, so you can see the repercussions now. And he had reversed that decision after the damage is done. You can see the farmers are totally uh, unproductive. There might be a shoot food shortage, uh, if, especially if you can't import any food without dollars. You can't base uh, all the food items uh, through local production. So this is, the, this is where I see the policy decisions mm. that have continuously been uh, made in a wrong and erroneous manner. When non-professionals like uh, Dr. Padeni are coming to this, I mean, he's a doctor, he's a medical doctor. What, what qualifications has he got to advise the government on agriculture? You can have your own views, but you know, we have, for example, for tea, you have the Tea Research Institution one of the oldest institutions in the country. You have the rubber research institution. You have the coconut research institution. So these, the inputs of these institutions have to be taken when you're making policy decisions on agriculture. None of that procedure was followed. So that is why we are facing the consequences today. You're a lawyer. What is uh, your understanding and uh, how supportive are you for the 21st Amendment that is uh, proposed? Well, we have always been <coughs> Uh, our party has been always for parliamentary power mm -hmm. and that's why we bought the 20th amendment. So as soon as this government came, they bought the uh, 20th amendment. So I think that's part of the conversation that the president and the prime minister had. Mm -hmm. He wants uh, the 20th amendment, uh, the 19th amendment implemented again through the 21st amendment. I think it's a very good and healthy thing for the country. I ask you this because you're also a parliamentarian who at one time supported the executive yeah. saying, to, to in, in that circumstance, mm. a strong executive was necessary mm. for the country. Mm. But going forward, do you think uh, executive powers pruned will be uh, the right decision for the Sri Lanka and that, that the parliament has uh, uh, bigger powers? The thinking now is, I think, uh, more to uh, strengthen the parliament. I think a majority of Sri Lankans want that. And certainly, I think the world is also moving in that uh, direction. We are executive power to the president is not entertained. I think perhaps the US president and the French president mm. uh, have so much power as, as presidents. But if you look at uh, Macron's appointment as a, as a uh, uh, Macron's appointment of a woman as a of a lady as a prime minister this time, certainly gives a lot of encouragement for uh, the enhancement and role of women. Especially in Europe, I see about seven or eight lady prime ministers. So, so when I see uh, in Sri Lanka, when Rohini Kaviratna is defeated for the deputy speaker, minor post like the deputy speaker, why can't they come to unanimity of giving it to a lady? So these are things, and we don't. We have 52 percent women in Sri Lanka, mm. and uh, that is not reflected in any any elected body mm. in parliament. At least we should be having minimum of 10 to 15 or 20 percent women to represent the 52 percent of women who are voters. We continue to speak of that, but we fail to uh, 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 make that happen to, yes. to create a setup for that. Why isn't Why isn't that happening though? Because especially, because especially young, especially young women journalists like you should take up that cause as well. Uh, we, we speak of that. I think parties also should take up uh, a, a bigger stance of allowing nominations yeah, for women yeah, academically yeah. and yeah. stronger women who are uh, educated yes, and qualified yeah. and who have the will to work yes. for the country. Yes. At the same time, um, I'd like to ask you about um, uh, the period of the good governance. Now, as we speak about the 21st Amendment, we keep bringing in amendments after amendments. A new constitution was also in discussion last year and mm. uh, up until this crisis um, deepened. Uh, why do you think back then you all could not, um, uh, could not uh, abolish the executive presidency? No, because there was no, um, I mean, the, the abolishing of the executive presidency was certainly spoken by the civil society and, and the movement for good governance. Mm -hmm. But uh, I must say for, uh, for the plus of Maitri Palasir he gave, he gave up a lot of the executive powers back to parliament. Mm -hmm. So we should have progressed on that. Then uh, the current president came and he appointed a committee headed by Ramesh De Silva. Mm -hmm. So we are not aware of the thinking of that uh, committee 
from what I understand, it is to strengthen the president's hand more, executive powers some more. So, so there is a diversity of thinking there because the president, until these problems came, I think he was entrenched in uh, strengthening he, the executive presidency. And certainly the Pohutu thinking is also that. But our thinking is more to do with uh, allowing parliament a greater role, allowing the pres prime minister a greater role. Actually, the it, should, it should be the, the president should be uh, the, the policy head. And, and the uh, prime minister should be the CEO of the country, mm. chief executive of the country. So if that model is uh, uh, implemented, and of course, under the 19th Amendment, uh, although the head of the cabinet was the president, it is with the concurrence of the prime minister the, uh, the cabinet is formulated. Mm. So the prime minister's consent is needed for cabinet appointments. So now it's not there. Mm. So, so basically I feel that um, there has to be a healthy balance between the prime minister and the president, mm. and you need a working relationship. So because the working relationship collapsed between uh, Maitripal and uh, Ranil Vikram Singh, that all those problems started. So, but, but then again, you look at, can I make one more very important okay. point? I think it's very important. In the, in the UNP, uh, the heads of government, the UNP, starting from Jaya Jayawardana, Jaya Jayawardana was the first, in the first cabinet, he was the finance minister. But when he became the president in 1977, okay. he allowed, he gave that job to a very, very uh, intelli intelli intelligent, capable man called Ronnie DeMille. Mm. And I think he was one of the best finance ministers we've had. Iconic finance Iconic, minister. yes, yes. So, so basically, th in the UNP, we believe in, uh, you know, not, not grabbing everything. We believe in appointing capable people to capable positions. Mm. Ranil also did that. Whatever his faults, Ravi Khanranayak was able to do a lot of uh, economic changes. He, he, he certainly, uh, you know, he, he, he got the economy going. Mm. And, and, uh, but here, in, from 1994, under the SLFP, you know, the, the president grabs the finance ministry. So, so Chandrika did that, and then Mahindra Rajapaksa did that. So I would say, if you really examine this crisis from 2019, if you had a more professional, more independent, and a more intelligent the finance minister who would grapple with these economic issues, we wouldn't have been in this position. So, so therefore, I would argue and say that, that the finance ministry is a crucial uh, aspect of running the economy, and it should be given to a professional. We have just a couple of minutes. Uh, what is your stance on the public protests and uh, also the violence that uh, we saw on the 9th of May? The Aragalia and the public protests are very good for Sri Lanka. Uh, it, it shows the mature and democratic nature of our country. Uh, it gives the, the freedom that uh, the people have to express themselves. Certainly it should never be curtailed. It should be allowed to go on. The, pub, the violence that happened was very, very unfortunate. And uh, they say it, it is planned. They say there was a sinister hand behind it. We have not seen the evidence of that yet. We are waiting to see the evidence. Uh, but, but it shows the frustration of the people and the anger of the people mm. to go and burn a house, and, and mind you, 55 to 60 houses of uh, politicians' houses. No, nobody deserves that. No, but no, no matter how uh, you may be a crook or you may be a thug or you may be a, uh, not, not a nice person, but nobody deserves your house to be burnt. We are a civilized society that goes back to 2,500 years of written Buddhist history, of written Tamil history. So, so it's, it's, I mean, I was shocked. I can't believe that kind of things happen still in Sri Lanka. So l the, the, the law and order of the country is sacrosanct in a country. If the law and order breaks down, um, the whole thing can crumble because we saw the IGP saying out of 184 uh, OICs, 182 were appointed on political, uh, political recommendations. So what, what is the police, police commission about? There's, there's a police commission, so that means the commissions have also now collapsed. Your late father was tipped to be Sri Lanka's next president then um, until uh, his life was cruelly ended by terrorism. Um, in this current context, uh, what kind of role do you intend to play, especially in the United National Party, as the party too plays a role uh, yeah. with the Prime Minister, and the new Prime Minister being uh, the head of the UNP, yeah. and what policies of your f late father do you expect uh, 
to implement in this current context very quickly before yeah. he died. Just, uh, yeah, so, so basically before he died, he, uh, you know, again, that was leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody told him not to run for the presidency. Uh, but he said, look, I'm taking the green f flag in my hands and I'm running for it. I don't think he expected to die, but, but he was such a leader that he wanted to run and make a difference. So that, that is what leaders do when, when, when there's a crisis, when, the, when, when you're needed, they rise up. So that, that, that in, that, in the current context, I think what my father did is also, uh, you know, also uh, encapsulate what le leadership is. I see my role really as a person who can join and, and amalgamate uh, and talk to both uh, Ranil Vikram Singh and Sajid and perhaps get a working relationship going. I, I think that's healthy for Sri Lanka, so healthy for democracy. But certainly I want to expose the center of right thinking of the UNP, which is essential for the prosperity of my country. I think that's essential because I think this, uh, this is extreme, this kind of leftist thinking of everything being done by the state and uh, you know state interfering in everything is is too much and it has really bankrupted my country but in the future i want a very healthy market driven entrepreneurship driven economy to be built up thank you very much for your time here at hyde park uh, former state minister of investment promotion minister of plantation industries and um, also the former national organizer of the united national party right. now in this thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for thank your you. time here um, of course we'll see you again next week at hyde park on other derana 24 with yet another episode have a pleasant evening good night